Hola, buenas tardes. Buenas noches. Good evening. Good morning, depending on what time you're watching this. But welcome, everybody. Bienvenidos a todos to En Casa con la Plaza, La Plaza de Cultura y Artes series of presentations, conversations, demonstrations of performances from our home to yours. De nuestra casa a su casa. As you know, lots of places are closed right now, including La Plaza de Cultura y Artes because of the pandemic. But we, of course, we need to keep the, the cultura going. And tonight we have a very special program for you. But before we start, I'd like you to know, welcome to all of you that are on Zoom. If you're on Facebook, bienvenidos to you. I invite you to start a watch party so you can share to your friends. We have a chat, of course, on Zoom. You can chat, ask questions. The same with Facebook. I'll get on Facebook right now to open it up and welcome you all. So keep the comments, keep them go coming. We'll, we'll find spots that we could make the comments. We'll ask our guest questions. But for now, I'd like to present her. This is our guest's second appearance mm -hmm. on En Casa Con La Plaza. She was one of our very first who uh, joined us here at En Casa uh, with a wonderful program on Loteria. Let me just scroll up a little bit so I could tell you about our guest. She was born in El Paso and raised in Mexico City. Uh, she's a border performer. Uh, she crosses various languages, disciplines, and music styles to carry on her musical mission that aims to educate and entertain. And I present to you Dr. Gloria Arjona, una buena amiga, and I think you're going to enjoy our presentation on Posadas Literary Calaveras. Take it away. Gloria. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Abelardo. And thank you for the invitation. Again, yes, I remember uh, a few months ago when we were doing these uh, presentations and we we're becoming experts little by little. So I appreciate all of you who are watching this kind of event. Thanks for your support. And today I have uh, something very uh, precious to me, as everything is. Uh, but this is actually the first book that I, I am publishing, and I will share my computer with you. And let me go to my PowerPoint. So, okay, so right here, this is my show. You have, uh, this is the cover. Actually, I have the cover here, but it's uh, clearer if you see it on the screen in the PowerPoint. So it's called, the book is called Posadas Unknown Calaveras. I bet if you are watching us, you are familiar with Posada. But if you are not, uh, let me tell you that he is one of the most influential artists, if not the most, of the last two centuries. He influenced uh, all the great muralists, Mexican muralists, and in fact, the cover of my book, which was chosen by, by the publishing house, it was published by Floricanto Press, um, is a detail of a mural by uh, Diego Rivera. The mural is called um, Dream of a Sunday afternoon in Alameda Central, and it's of uh, 1946. But, uh, and the first uh, feeling I had when they, in, when I saw, when they proposed me in the publishing house to use this, uh, this um, detail uh, for the cover, I say, well, but I'm, it's a little bit contradictory because I am, uh, the name of the book is Posadas Unknown Calaveras, and right here we have the most known calavera of Posada. Calavera means school um, in, in English, and Posada, this is the artist uh, on, on the right of, of the, on the left, I'm sorry, yeah. So, so first I was kind of uneasy about the title, but then I realized, well, it's, it's very appropriate. First of all, because uh, in this mural, Diego Rivera gave for the first time 
the protagonism in, in a mural, in a, in a work of art, in a public of art, to uh, this calavera. So it's like a, she became a character, un personaje. So, and not only that, but Diego Rivera painted the artist Posada here to the left of what he called La Catrina. And of course, on the, on the right, most of you have already identified is uh, Frida Kahlo, another artist that always recognized the influence of Jose Guadalupe Posada. And Diego himself is in, the, in this uh, mural, but as a child. And, and it not only has uh, Mexican characters, because if you see and if you recognize to the right of uh, Frida Kahlo, there is a Cuban modernist patriotic poet, Jose Martí. So one possible interpretation of, uh, of this mural, of this detail, of this mural in general, is that death is common for everybody. And that is something that we are going to talk about. And that, that, that's one of the main themes. More, um, I would rather say, death is for everyone. Death is a great equalizer, la gran igualadora. We all, no matter sex, gender, color of skin, whatever, we are equal in the eyes of death. Um, this uh, skeleton originally was conceived by uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada around the year um, 1910, the year of the Mexican Revolution, uh, when it started uh, as La Calavera Garbancera. He didn't call this calavera La Catrina as we know it today. La Catrina has become, sometimes is the only calavera, the only school, the only work sometimes that we know of uh, Jose, Clement, um, uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada, uh, because she has become the icon of the Day of the Dead celebration. But originally, and, and it's called La Catrina, Catrina, Catrin in Mexico is a, is a Mexicanismo, and it means uh, a person that is very pretentious. And uh, originally, Posada called her Calavera Garbancera, like a garbanzo bean eater would be uh, a school. And, uh, this is a, a, a calavera, this is a character that is uh, misunderstood in many ways because what Posada was criticizing back then was not to the, uh, to, to the women of the high class, but to women that pretended to be, to belong to, uh, to the high class, La Catrina, El Catrin, for those of you who are familiar with La Loteria, eh, eh, he was originally criticizing those people that want to belong to a class that they do not belong. Un Catrin, una Catrina are those people that will uh, put everything in the appearance, in the, in the clothing, eh, and even if they don't have anything to eat at home. So originally, those were the people that uh, Posada was, uh, were criti was criticizing. And uh, as I said before, he called him el, el, La Calavera Garbancera, but then Posada decided to name uh, her La Catrina. So well, in, in short, it's important, uh, after all, the, uh, the cover is related, of course, to what is in the content, even if we are talking right here about the, the unknown calaveras, okay? But of course, this is the most known calavera. But what are the unknown calaveras? And as uh, Abelardo uh, pointed out in the title, 
the unknown calaveras or, or barely known calaveras are the literary calaveras. And that's the part I want to highlight, the, the literary work of Jose Guadalupe Posada that is seldom, frequently overlooked. And of course, whenever we talk about the work of Posada, we are talking about, by extension, uh, to the imagery, uh, the, the Im uh, imaginary, imaginaria, to the images of uh, Day of the Dead. All the images that we see now in during the Day of the Dead are uh, a creation of Jose Guadalupe Posada. Uh, so, so that's why I, I thought that it was important to recover uh, this tradition of uh, literary calaveras uh, and to recognize Posada not only as an artist, as an visual artist, but also as a poet, even if we are talking about popular poetry. So you can see, as you can see this uh, in his uh, Calavera Garbancera, see even that the text, and these are like a quartets of uh, poetry, very, very easy rhyming, which is actually, those are the, the literary calaveras. And, and notice, the importance Posada always gave to his literary work, but now we do uh, we we overlook it. So, as you can see, this is another. Well, this is a this is a La Catrina. This is part of the book uh, I am introducing. Uh, but let me before talking about her, let me show you for those of you who are not very familiar with the. All the work of Posada. Right here we have more uh, examples of the importance that poetry, that the written part, had always in his work, okay? El Pantheon Amoroso is like a, um, a story, okay? A story that might even be like a, this is a story, a love story, okay? But see, image and text image and text. So that, that's what I was always curious. Uh, I, I gave a presentation a few months ago about La Loteria, and that's another, uh, another Mexican tradition where we sometimes leave aside the rhyming that accompany the playing. And uh, without, like, uh, if we have the lottery, a lottery card, an image, but there, is, there are some verses that accompany those images. And without that, it's not as exciting as it is using all the elements that they were originally conceived uh, with. So I say that I was going to talk about this because as you can see, uh, let me make a, a remark here. Yes, Posada didn't call this character La Catrina, it was Diego Rivera who baptized, baptized her as La Catrina, but Posada used the term and the concept of Catrina. It was a popular concept. In fact, I was uh, researching who was the first one to use, because as I say before, Catrina is a Mexicanismo. So uh, I found out that it was during the 19th century uh, one of the first uh, novels after the independence, uh, written by uh, Lizardi and um, El Periquillo Sarniento, uh, that they use the concept of Catrin Catrina, as I explained uh, before, as the concept of La Garbancera. So it would be the same thing. La Garbancera, Cala Calavera Garbancera and La Catrina defines the same woman in this case that is very pretentious, and that is just the appearance, okay? She pretends to belong to a class that she does not belong. Because we have to understand that Mexico, uh, during the 19th century, uh, it had uh, barely had its independence, in, that was in 1810, and it ended with a, with a system that was established by the Spanish crown that is called casta system, uh, and, and based on your race, was your uh, your status, your social status. Of course, the white 
male Spaniard was at the top and at the bottom, the dark skinned Indians and the Afro descendants, okay? So it was a very racist uh, and sexist system. And that's something that even if it was abolished after the independence, it kept for a few years, probably until today, okay? So the people wanted to pretend that's why in, in Mexico, people are more uh, pretentious. Whenever you go, even if you go to the store, you don't want to go with the worst clothing that you have because you don't want to, uh, to be confused, uh, to, to be, uh, I, I, you don't want to give the, the impression that you belong to a very low class and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those, all those prejudices are still reflected in our modern society. So, so look, this is a Katrina actually how uh, Posada conceived uh, in the few years before this one, because like, as I said before, this one is uh, from 1910, 1911, and this one is from the uh, 1901, more or less, okay? Which is the one that I present in, in my book. So uh, um, that's what I say, Posada's unknown calaveras. This uh, term imply many things because this is the minor work of Posada. I have a tendency to go to, to those uh, books or, or those aspects of a very well-known artist or writer that uh, are not taken into consideration. So I found uh, during the pandem pandemia, pandemic, uh, I found a hundred sets and I, I thought it was uh, precious. I was looking for some information about La Loteria, or Posada, and I found them in the S Smithsonian Museum and I found that they were for, for free to use. So I say, well, this is a moment. So this is, these are very uh, small uh, work, silography means uh, wood printing, and is uh, the size, the original size is like a, of the image is like around uh, less than three inches. So again, very simple. But again, they are accompanied. They were originally accompanied with these verses. And when I saw them, I said, "Well, these are the literary calaveras." Look what it says in the in the Spanish. I translated into English. I know that trans translating poetry is not easy, <laughs> and and translating humor is. Uh, sometimes impossible, but I, I just wanted to give an idea of, uh, of what it says. So what he originally said, la Catrina pretenciosa echa el resto del vestir, y el vestido dominguero al zócalo va a lucir. También allí han de asistir los rateritos bribondes que haciéndose los simplones se aprovechan de la frasca y robando los doblones se dance de ellos su tarasca. So this is called a literary cal uh, calavera. Uh, in the book, I have the translation, okay? Um, and and some of the characteristics of the literary calavera, the unknown calaveras, is uh, that, of course, it rhymes, very easy rhyme, vestir, lucir, asistir, we call it parallel rhymes, okay, they are, they are easy. They are uh, in eight syllables, usually. Sometimes it's a quartet, so in this case, he uses a lot uh, verses of five, uh, five uh, verses, the, the stanzas of five verses. And uh, something important is that they have a lot of irony. Like right here, La Catrina, the pretentious Catrina, she goes to the Zócalo, to the plaza with her best, her best outfit, even if probably she didn't eat anything for many days to buy that precious outfit. And she is pretending to be rich. And of course, there are also people, rateros, stealers, that go over there pretending also that they are just enjoying and, and they are part of the of the verbena and they are there to and they end up stealing from the Katrina everything just because she was pretentious okay some of the uh 
aspects or, or, or um, characteristics of the literary calaveras besides being um, ironic is that uh, as death is they give everyone what they deserve. So that's what happened to the Katrina because, because of, of, uh, it's like a, a morale. She was pretentious, so that's why they ended up stealing everything from her. Um, I found that, um, I, I, I always, this is not something that I recently found. I, I always had, uh, since I was a student in, in USC, a uh, literature st st student, I found very interesting and very, this, these calaveras seem very familiar to me when I study uh, literature of the medieval times. Why? Because we have Posada. So I say, does it have any influence? Did, did this uh, composite, this pairs of image and text just as Posada does have something to do with Posada? And then in this book, I am uh, saying that indeed they did, as I'm going to explain, okay? So there is a tradition, a medieval tradition that is called the Dance of Death. And one of the main uh, authors was uh, Hans Holbein. Uh, was, he was very, very popular. He was from, from Germany uh, in the 15th century. And, uh, and, and he kind of created, of course, this was an older tradition, but he put together these uh, images and texts real, uh, around the death. He had another intention very different than Posada, as I'm going to explain, okay? He was more like a, a Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, or the, the German, the, the leader of the Protestant movement. So, he wanted to, um, to make, to ridicule the church, but for very different reasons that later on will have Posada. And uh, he also wanted the people to be aware that uh, you have to behave in this world because at the end you are going to, uh, to die. Okay, so, so he and, and many other uh, visual artists uh, before and after, but more uh, over after him uh, did this uh, dance of death, uh, literary allegories, that literary and also visual. So that's why called my attention. Now, as uh, right here, here you see the, the death as a main character, as just as we did in Posada, except that this is from the 16th century. Or, or late 15th century. Now, what was the meaning of this dance? The meaning of the dance is that we all are going to die. In the dance, usually the, the, the death would invite people of several uh, uh, social status. They are actually were not too many, <laughs> but uh, they, they, uh, the, the death would invite the a person from, from the, that represented the church, uh, the nobility, and gradually until uh, ending with a, with a peasant or un campesino. And it means that all of them, it, no matter what is the, no matter their social uh, class or their power, they will end up dying in the same dance. Um, so, so what it, it really calls my attention, I know, I, and I know that of many people that are, are watching this, uh, this presentation, because when we think about a death in Mexico and the day of the death, we think uh, in uh, our rich uh, Mesoamerican tradition, like the Zompantli, which were these, these schools that uh, walls of schools that uh, people put like a trophies, como trofeos of their, of their enemies, okay? And we always uh, think 
those of us who are familiar with the Mesoamerican concept of death, uh, the important cult to the the Señor, the God, and the Goddess of the underworld, who was Mictlantecutli and Mictecasiwatl. So I was sure, and as I suppose that many of you were sure, that uh, our rituals around the Day of the Dead came only from our indigenous past, which is very important. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't have a strong influence, but what I'm saying is that there is a, a, a direct connection of the work of Posada with the dance of death. Usually, uh, something that I that I seen differently, because of course there are differences, and some differences are more spiritual sometimes. Like for example, what I have not found. In, in the other verses, in the previous verses of the Germans or, or French, uh, a, a, and, and something that differentiates mainly the Calavera Literarias of Posada is the idea of carpe diem, the idea of leave the moment because uh, we are going to die. Okay. It's like a, that idea was not present in the work of uh, Holbein, for example. Imagine, it would be just the opposite. They wanted the people to warm, it's something uh, me memento moris, that they want to warm, okay, don't enjoy too much, okay, because you are going to die and then you will have to explain those, uh, your behavior. But in Mexico, around um, Day of the Dead, there is this idea of live the moment. And of course, in the work of Jose Guadalupe Posada, we have that carpe diem. Like this is the first calavera, and as I say, it's very, very simple. Okay, we have a, a, a bureaucrat. The calaveras, another thing, uh, another characteristic is that they are uh, written as epithets. Uh, epithets, perdón, I'm sorry. Uh, it means that as if the people were already died in their graves. Okay, so sometimes, well, most of the times, the people are alive. We give, uh, we make these compositions for a friend, for a relative, or a co-worker, okay? And they are alive, okay? And it doesn't mean that we are willing them to die or something. It's just that we have this tradition that unfortunately is uh, we, we are not preserving. In the school, some schools and, and some uh, in cultural institutions, they are doing the literary calaveras, but we don't do it anymore because we don't have time. But now, with the pandemic, we have time. So right here, this is the very first one. And, and look what it's ad advising. It says in Spanish, Entre libros y anaqueles, pasé mi vida de empleado. ¿Y cuál fue el resultado? Pues ya me miran ustedes. It's like, among books and cases, my life I spent. And how did I end? Well, see by yourselves. He ended up eh, dead, as everybody. And on top of everything, he didn't enjoy life. So that's something that I have observed is very different in the uh, tradition of calaveras, mainly literary calaveras uh, of Jose Guadalupe Posada, this idea. Um, this is a very clear example. Sometimes the, the audience, Okay, I always take the commentaries of the audience, the remarks, the questions. Sometimes they ask me, was uh, Posada aware of that tradition? And I really think he was. When you see these uh, similitudes, okay? See, uh, and then look, the verse and the image. And Posada, uh, right here, this is the Calavera uh, of Don Quixote. Why did I put it here? Because Posada was an educated, even if he, he is a popular artist, even if all the, the work he did was to, to educate and to inform the main, the masses that most of them didn't know how to read and write, and some of them did not even speak Spanish, okay? they would speak a, a native language. Uh, even uh, with those um, 
he, he, he wanted to get to those people. That's why we call him El Artista Popular. So still, he was an educated man. He studied lithography and he was a teacher in, um, he was a teacher for, for many years. Uh, he taught lithography. So he was an educated man. He must have for sure be aware of uh, all this uh, uh, literature and history of other countries. And on top of that, besides working for uh, Arroyo, um, Venegas Arroyo, where he did most of his work, he worked for a very important um, a publishing house of Barcelona, the Mau Mauki uh, Brothers. So, so he was very informed where he, he was the illustrator, the main illustrator, and it was literature of the world, okay? Eventually they did on mainly from Mexico, but originally was literature, um, cheap literature in, in the way that they wanted, they, they had the idea of ma mass production, okay? Now, something very important that relates to Loteria, because always the name of Jose Guadalupe Posada comes always, okay? In fact, I was studying and continue studying and writing my book on La Loteria, but then I found these very interesting things. Okay, uh, Posada is uh, among the first um, people, the first uh, artist to publish a Loteria in, in a non-artisan way, okay? Because before him, people in their houses, they would make the Loterias at home, but Posada, again, because he used the, the printing, uh, he created the first loterias. He and, and his uh, master, um, his teacher, uh, Manuel Manila. Okay, right here you can see that he included La Muerte with the one psych, I believe, because I was thinking, why? Do they have this instrument? Why is La Loteria? This Loteria is by Clemente Jacques, but it was based in the image of Posada because as I said before, Posada was the first creator of uh, Las Loterias, okay? And then it came this uh, French immigrant and he uh, inspired himself in the Loteria of Posada. So uh, for, for me, this is a clue also of the influence of, of, the, of their conception this representation comes from, this is uh, from the Tarot, okay, which is, it is an image from the 15th century. And you see the death with the, with the psyche, la guadaña, and that's the way it was represented in Europe, okay? So, so Posada was originally thinking in this representation, which uh, at the, uh, it, it comes from a Tarot, but that Tarot image comes from the, da the dance of death, okay? Um, and then I was thinking, and maybe you are thinking, well, maybe La Muerte, yes. But then why La Calavera? La Calavera, for sure, it belongs to the tradition of the Aztecs. I was thinking that. But then I researched and I found that there is a, a tradition of uh, illustrate that dates back to the 12th century, of, if you can see the, the right here, I couldn't find a better one, okay? But at uh, the death, the, La Calavera school, okay, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, La Muerte is the death and La Calavera is uh, the school. And of course, you will say, why two, uh, <laughs> uh, two people, uh, two, why two characters uh, alluding to the death? Because it was Jose Guadalupe Posada. He was interested in this thing. And then, as you can see, Right here, we have the, the school with the cross bones. And, and I realized that it, uh, it was a, a com it commonly used in the crucifix. And, uh, and it means that uh, it was a, like a recognition that had to do with the, the death of uh, Jesus Christ, of course, okay, this crucifix. And in fact, calavera, the word calavera, uh, if, you, if you remember, those of you who know, Jesus Christ was crucified in El Golgota, 
that was the mountain, the name of the mountain, El Golgota. And Golgota means school, Calavera. So the, the Calavera that uh, inspired Jose Guadalupe Posada for La Loteria and eventually Jose Clement, um, Clemente Jacques was from this crucifix. Okay, so I found uh, instead of uh, finding it like, a, oh, so it doesn't belong to the, to the indigenous tradition, as I say before, I am exploring right here in this book, I am uh, pointing uh, to the connection of the work of the schools of the Calaveras of Posada with the concept of the dance of death. But uh, it doesn't mean that there is not influence, of course. In all the Mexican traditions, we cannot deny our indigenous, uh, strong indigenous influence. And sometimes, as I say before, it's more uh, sophisticated in a, in a more spiritual uh, manner that not, not as tangible sometimes as it is in this case. Um, some people also, some people of the audience have told me, okay, but uh, those calaveras, they are not humorous. And Posada it is. But then I found, it's another humor. But I found this from the 18th century. And the same thing is of the tradition, because as I say before, uh, there is a tradition that has been a continuous tradition of among printmakers of using this concept of the dance of death. Okay, so this is an English one and it's, it's, it's supposed to be funny, the, the drunk and alive, the, the death is telling the, right here we see two parts, okay, so right here the, this guy, the one that later on is going to be <laughs> a cadaver. Uh, he was drinking and having fun and eating probably because he's a little bit gordito and smoking and everything, okay. And then, of course, with that kind of life, you see the lesson, uh, death comes for him. And the woman is kind of complaining and he said, drunk and alive, the man was time. It was yours, but dead and drunk, why? He's mine, okay. So it's humorous, it's another kind of humor. But it doesn't mean that this tradition is just humorous in Mexico. So that's something that I also point out in this book. And then I found, every time I find more and more interesting things, I found that uh, Camille Sanson, the French composer that was um, contemporary of Jose uh, Guadalupe Posada, uh, he made very famous the dance, uh, uh, La Danse Macabre, as they say, or the Dance of Death, uh, with a composition with that name, that at the, at the beginning was kind of, uh, the reception was, was shocking, and later on, uh, it was adopted and adapted in many places of the world, okay? And, and it, has, it was based in some verses of the Dance of Death, of that tradition. So this is, Fascinating. I, I hope you find uh, as fascinating as in, let me see the, the time because I don't want, I found, because another thing as Mexicans we say, well, but Mexico and of course Los Angeles and San Antonio, those places with uh, an important uh, Mexican population, we have big celebrations about during the day of the death. But then I found that in a place of uh, Spain, more in Catalonia, since the medieval ages, they have been celebrating their own way, of course, these kind of processions that I'm going to show you. Let me make sure that, uh, the, that the sound is good because sometimes uh, optimize, well, I, I guess, I hope that the sound is good. And right here is a one minute. Proceso de Verges.
well, as you could see, they had a handless clock, un reloj sin manecillas, that means that death is unpredictable. So it has, again, another feeling, but it was interesting to find out that they have these uh, people, that they are usually five, uh, five uh, danzantes, and they are using the skeleton uh, costume, and they do this procession, mainly, uh, or usually, usually, they do it always, I'm sorry, during uh, April, okay. So right here, uh, this is, we have just a few, uh, I think we have a couple of photographs by Jose, of Jose Guadalupe Posada, and this is a, a, a print, a very uh, a drawing by Leopoldo Mendes, which was another artist influence, of course, by, by him, because unfortunately, Jose Guadalupe Posada, even though he was very well recognized during his time, um, and even, as I say before, he, important people met him, uh, he died practically unknown in poverty, in, in Tepito, Mexico. Uh, he died in 1913, when the revolution was already starting, had already started. And he even was buried in a communal, uh, without, uh, ironically, he was buried with uh, a lot of people that he never known. Okay. So uh, this is something, it was until a French uh, artist whose name is uh, Jean Charlot arrived to Mexico in 1945, 1946, and he recognized the work of Jose Guadalupe Posada that everybody started talk, talking about Jose Guadalupe Posada, but he had already uh, been uh, dead for many years, okay? Uh, what does he uh, represent in his calaveras, in particularly in these calaveras that I am presenting in, in my book? Well, first I wanted to give a few, uh, a, a few some, some information about the times, the turbulent times uh, in Mexico that Jose Guadalupe Posada lived. He was born in 1952, but notice, we know that 18, I mean, 1852. <laughs> notice that 1848 had been the, the sign of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And what had happened with Mexico? It was fragmented. It was uh, practically uh, left in half of the country it was because it was the war with the United States, okay? So Guadalupe Posada did not leave that, but his parents did. So we, we must imagine that, okay? His parents leave that fragmentation of, um, of the country. He, he was born in Aguascalientes and he died in Mexico City, as I said before. Not, not very old, okay? And then he lived, he was born in, in 1852, and he lived, I'm sorry, right here is missing, uh, I don't know, too many numbers, okay? <laughs> but he lived the, the wars of reform. It was a, a, an eternal war between uh, liberals and conservatives. It might sound very familiar to you. Uh, so he lived that also. And he lived the nationalization of the church property. Before, before that, the church had a lot of power. He, he even criticizes the church a lot. And he uh, lived uh, when Benito Juarez, because he lived during uh, the presidency of uh, Benito Juarez, and uh, he confiscated many the, the goods of the church, okay? And then he lived the French empire. Uh, there was, uh, on Cinco de Mayo, we celebrate the victory of Mexico over the French, but in Mexico was indeed, there were three, um, two French interventions, and uh, the second time the French stayed in Mexico. And we will see, that's important to, to point out, because, of course, the, the elite, la élite, they wanted to live uh, the life of the French people, okay? Every, Mexico was, it was a time that just a few 
uh, could live a very good life and, and just a few, like a 3% of the population. Most of uh, the people, 97%, they don't have access to anything, okay? So Jose Guadalupe Posada, he lived that. He lived also the Porfiriato, this uh, dictator that we have uh, for more than 30 years, from 1876 to 1910, and Posada lived that. And that's why at the beginning he was kind of, uh, had some sympathy for Porfirio Diaz, but after the guy stayed like uh, for more than 30 years and, and, and he was really a despot, a despot with, with the indigenous population, mainly uh, with the Mayans in the south and, and the Jackie in the north, then Posada eventually became more and more against uh, Porfirio Diaz. And he lived the first uh, years of the Mexican Revolution. So I like to see this, uh, this is a great uh, drawing uh, because Posada is, uh, is observing. He was always observing and of course most of the time, uh, as I said before, uh, it was uh, during a century that was very turbulent uh, in Mexico and that's why what he uh, records, and that's why he criticizes in these Calaveras Literarias. I found that uh, this is Holbein's, the German uh, artist and, uh, that I presented, introduced before, uh, that worked for Martin Luther. And, uh, and this is the work of, of Posada in wow. these uh, 100 uh, sets of rhymes and uh, images and i found this is amazing because i found that that the same characters like the bishop uh, the bishop the nobleman uh, the, the the priest the cura all of those are criticized also by posada but of course for different in, in some in some cases for different reasons so this is i i really feel um a very enthusiastic about this work. I know this is a very uh, simple, simple in a way that is kind of a small book and, and uh, the, the, the letters are kind of big. So at the beginning I say, oh, it looks like a children <laughs> book, but, but, but I like it because uh, I, want to, I want you to use it um, during the day of the death to read the Calaveras and to teach the, 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 this tradition to our children, our youngs. They, they like it. I have, I have done Calavera Literarias with my, in my classes. And even though I don't, um, I don't teach to um, Mexican or Latinos, I teach uh, mainly to people from other countries, uh, but still they enjoy it. And, and they can do it, okay, because they are easy to, to do. Uh, one of the calaveras and one of the main themes in this book is the same as uh, the one of the death, um, the dance of death, death as a great equalizer, okay? Calaveras del Montón. That was an expression that um, Jose Guadalupe Posada used a lot. Let me see how is the time here. Okay, we have a few minutes. So right here, let me read this for you. Of course, the way I suggest to read is with some music, as I'm going to present uh, later on in a few minutes. Um, I suggest that these calaveras had to be uh, read uh, with uh, some music at the bottom. There is some performative uh, in this, uh, in the way to read these calaveras. Okay, so right here it says, Es calavera el inglés? Calavera, sí, señor. Calavera fue el francés, y Fauré, y Sadi Carnot. El chino, el americano, el papa y los cardenales, reyes, duques, concejales, y el jefe de la nación, en la rumba son iguales, calaveras del montón. So, as you can see right here, I put the, the English uh, translation, everyone the same concept as the dance of death. From the very important people, French people, to people that are as not as important as they are, but we in la rumba means in the dance. You see, in the dance, we are all the same. Um, right here, this is very um, 
pertinent, very relevant to what is happening because this is dedicated to um, an incompetent official that could not control an epidemic outbreak. I always say any resemblance with what is happening is just a coincidence. It says, el señor Don Emeterio, alcalde de un pueblo agreste, tomó formal y muy serio medidas contra la peste ensanchando el cementerio. And uh, since we have just a few minutes, something I, I always uh, find, found, uh, I always find interesting about Jose Guadalupe Posada is that he, um, he addresses the Afro-descendant population in Mexico in a time that the institutions were not recognizing that we have an, indeed an important Afro-descendant population. So Jose Guadalupe Posada, he has a, a sketches, he has prints of Afro-descendants, Afro-Mexicans, I would say. So he has a Calaveras Against Racism, okay? And uh, something he loves a lot is the world, uh, the word play, like a tamal. You know, everybody knows what is tamal, but tamal in Spanish sounds like está mal. Está mal. If I say está mal out of context, I, I can, I understand like, a, oh, it's a tamal or this is wrong. So he plays with that in this calavera, okay? And uh, as I say before, I want to end, and then if you have any questions or commentaries, I will uh, gladly answer. Um, this is a way I suggest to read the calaveras. So right here, yeah, Abelardo, we have like a two minutes? Yeah, okay. So let me, let me uh, play this that I recorded before because, you know, with Zoom, we never know. <laughs> so right here, this is, death makes justice turning cheaters into piles of schools. So he also, he not only uh, criticized the rich, but also those uh, people that are, could be, in this case, they are barbers of, or, or bar, barmans who, uh, who cheat. So, so the, those are calaveras are for them. So let me play for you. Tan exacto en vigilar, tan cumplido en su deber, que dejaba a los rateros hicieran su oficio bien. Por eso pues la huesuda se lo aventó en dos por tres y hoy solo oye que le dicen requiescat in pase amén. Con navaja de hoja lata rasuraba a Don Nachito y a todo cliente raspaba como si fuera marrano. Pero un sábado llegó en que la muerte ligera sin querer me lo volvió barbacoa de calavera. El pulque como ninguno sabía a Romero componer le echaba miados de gato y agua de jabón también. Por eso es hoy calavera, requiescat y pase a mí. Ok, so this is uh, basically what I have for all of you today. And uh, again, the book was published by Floricanto Press. I am very thankful to, to them. And uh, you can get the book over there or you can be my friends, even better, in Facebook. <laughs> Send me a message and I will gladly give you all the information. Thank you, Abelardo. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Gloria. That was incredible. Uh, we have a lot, a few questions here, and I know we do have some time. So, um, one of them is from Sylvia Villegas. Okay, what? And this is why did I you? Sylvia. Yeah, in the times of COVID, <laughs> write a book about calaveras, which represent a comic side of death. Uh, is it your personal way to send a message of strength to your audience? 
it, it can be because uh, and, and that's something um, that's something that psychologically I think uh, it helped us uh, as Mexicans or Mexican descendants that uh, we know that death is there. It's not a surprise for us <laughs> because we grew up. So it's, it's something that in other cultures they don't accept death, but in a way, at least as an image, we know that it exists. So it doesn't get us by surprise. So yes, Silvia, I think that is, is a way also to, to heal a little bit or to, to put the stress a little bit, bit in, in those images, in those calaveras, yes. Okay, on Facebook, uh, Monica Martinez had a couple questions. Uh, where does that term garbancera come from? Garbancera, well, uh, Posada, he invented, and it would be a person, a lady that sells garbanzo. Maybe. Or also can be a lady who only eats garbanzo because their garba the garbanzos are cheap. I don't know now. <laughs> with, the, with the pandemic, they were not cheap at the beginning. Okay. So, so, so that's instead of frijolera, you know, we usually use biner or frijolera, <laughs> but he's using garbancera. He's also changing a little bit. Uh, so again, it means the Katrina, originally those ladies that I'm sure, Monica, you know a lot, those ladies, pretentious ladies that don't have anything to eat, but they are wearing or something that is um, very expensive. Now would be an imitation. <laughs> All right, uh, and Monica has another question. Uh, yes. The Guadalupe Cemetery in Aguascalientes with this death representation murals and poems, did it have any influence on your work or do you know about it? About who, I'm sorry? It's the Guadalupe Cemetery in Aguascalientes. It has well, I, uh, I'm sorry. representation uh -huh. of murals and poems. Yeah, well, no, no, but it's, it's good to know. Thank you for, for the hint. I mean, I, I, I am a fan of the Facebook page of the Museum of Jose Guadalupe Posada in Aguascalientes, but I didn't know about the cemetery, so, so it's an, a place I definitely going to explore. Thank you for the for the hint. Okay, one more question. Uh, did Posada mix characters or did he change the style at a certain point that you that you know of? Yes, I know that uh, after the revolution, of course, at the, from the beginning, and he was not the only one that used uh, La Muerte. Before him, his, his maestro, Manuel Manila, that sometimes we don't pay too much attention to him. Uh, but of course, uh, what, um, Jose Guadalupe Posada developed that idea more. And as far as I know, after, during, uh, during the revolution, not after because he died before the revolution ended, um, around the Mexican revolution, he started to use more and more the skeletons. Why? Well, because death was around the corner. So he found in, in death, in la muerte, a, a perfect icon uh, of what was going on in Mexico during the revolution and the, the times of the Mexican revolution. So yes, he changed because at the beginning he got, as you saw in the Katrina here, is more a realistic uh, figure, even if he used calaveras always, but it's more like a realistic. And then eventually he was more, in, more and more in the school making. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, just a few comments. Uh, Audrey Chavez, thank you for your research and passion that you have so graciously made contagious. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. We have uh, Elena Errada from Detroit uh, uh -huh. saying, uh, this is a drink of water in the desert. Uh, thank you very much, Elena. Thank you. And uh, Chispa Hills, one of our big fans who's attended almost all of our sessions, the book looks like it will be very clear, and that is the most important way we can share true information. I'm ready to order it, and I hope to be able to sh share this with my students. Muchas gracias. That, that's the purpose. Thank you very much for doing that. Yes, we need to, to preserve this because people usually ask me, uh, oh, so, so they, they don't use, uh, they don't write. As I say before, we do it, some teachers, we do it, but unfortunately not in our uh, work or, or for our colleagues or, or friends as it used to be. So we need to recover this tradition. And, and mainly now that we are changing and we are adapting and we're becoming more audio. So I think it's a good time to start with this tradition. Thank you. Well, just wanna uh, thank everybody who attended. Uh, Victor Alvarado from Culver City. 
Lisa Mar Marie Ruiz from Oxnard. We have uh, Sheila de Amico from Pueblo, Colorado. Oh, they're, they're coming in from everywhere. Uh, thank you all very much for, for viewing. Uh, if you didn't catch the entire presentation, it will be on our YouTube. We, we uh, archive everything on Facebook, of course. We're, we're recording this as well as we're streaming, but on our YouTube page at La Plaza LA, youtube.com slash La Plaza LA, you'll catch all of our sessions of En Casa on that page. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. If you enjoy our En Casa sessions, please join as a member of La Plaza. Our members make these programs possible. I'm gonna, head it, I'm gonna go ahead and drop in the link to become a member. We also, if you just, uh, you could make a donation to La Plaza, one-time donation, whatever. But we want to thank you. We want to also thank our sponsors, SoCal Gas and the California Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security uh, Stabilization Plan of 2020. It's unfortunate times right now, of course, with the, uh, having to shelter in place, staying safe, but it's programs like this that, that give us life, that give us yes. hope. And thank you very much for, for bringing it to us, uh, Gloria. Uh, I'd like to just talk about uh, the future programming. Uh, we, we're on at least three days a week. This Friday, the return of Dan Guerrero with his happy hour. So get your drinks ready for <laughs> special guest, Edward James Olmos. And I, I don't need to say more. That's Friday, August 7th at 7 p.m. And then if you don't know too much about drinks, and who doesn't? <laughs> if you don't, on Monday, we have our, every Monday, we have En Casa con la Plaza Cocina, which is our cooking demonstrations, and the return of Maite Gomez Rejon of Art Bites will share, be sharing some recipes for margaritas y palomas. Oh, and then finally, on Wednesday, uh, we have the return of Beto Arcos, the music journalist and, and uh, Bon Vivant of La Musica, who will be bringing on Gabby Moreno. Uh, Gabby's a uh, singer, songwriter, producer. She's earned NAMI, Grammy nominations and a wonderful musician. And she'll, so she'll be in conversation with Beto Arcos. You can catch all of our programming at La Plaza's website. And I'll go ahead and drop that in as well. A, a lot of great programming coming up in August. Of course, August 29th is the 50th anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium. So we'll be wrapping up some programs uh, during that week uh, to commemorate uh, that, uh, that tragic but yet hopeful event that really brought Chicano activism to a head uh, and, and has been with us since then. Uh, muchas gracias, Gloria. Any last ah, words? Un placer, okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Los vemos muy pronto. We'll see you real soon. And again, catch us on, on YouTube, on our Facebook page, La Plaza's website. And we're also on Twitter, Instagram. Share with your friends. Let them know that we're here en casa con La Plaza con ustedes. Buenas noches a todos. Muchas gracias, Gloria. Parece.